To start off, I want to ask you about something that as soon as I say it, some people might roll their eyes or wonder why are we even talking about that now, but that I have to believe is among the more fundamental, if not foundational aspects of nutrition and supplementation for performance, and that's hydration, right? I mean, I think we hear hydration, it's like, okay, we have to drink six to eight glasses of water every day. Our urine should be relatively clear. If it's too dark yellow, we're not doing a good job of hydrating enough. Yeah. How much of that is true? Um, is alkaline water worthwhile <laughs> for changing the alkalinity of my body? I learned when I was in college and graduate school that the alkalinity of the different tissues in your body is very well controlled in order to keep you alive and that you don't want it to shift too much or you can enter pretty horrible states of seizure, vomiting, and even death. So tell me about hydration and woven into that, if you would, educate me on electrolytes and hydration because I think most often when people ingest electrolytes, sure, they could be ingesting salt tablets, probably getting some electrolytes. By the way, electrolytes, sodium, magnesium, potassium, through their food. I think most people think about drinking electrolytes. So water and electrolytes, I think is a vitally important topic to kick this off with. Sure, we can jump right into your alkaline water. Um, while there's perhaps much to say about this, there's probably a few things you should do before worrying about the alkalinity of your water. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Meaning the alkalinity of the water is, is sort of irrelevant? Not that you won't go that far. It's just, it's probably, remember we sort of started off talking about 80-20? Um, well, this would be in my like 99.1 in terms of like, if we're really at the level of worrying about the pH of their, your drinking fluid, uh, we have optimized so many other things uh, that then we can talk about it. But until we have nailed uh, months and years of work on other things, this is just not going to make much of an impact. Great. Then perhaps you could tell us about what volume of water we should be drinking, when we should be drinking that water relative to training and just generally. And, um, yeah, and anything else related to water and electrolytes that can improve mental performance, physical performance, and offset any you know, ill effects. I like the fact that you mentioned physical and mental performance because it's clear in both cases. We hear that we need to drink more water, and I can give you some numbers, and I will in a second. What we also need to recognize is there's, this is hormesis. We talked about hormesis a, a few episodes ago, and this is the case, right? Whether we talked about food or hydration or I think I gave you the example of cyanide uh, naturally occurring in your food. Hot water is the same way. So if you are underhydrated or dehydrated, then there is a clear negative effect on your body. And as I increase the level or improve the level of hydration, things get better, whether this is physical performance or whether this is mental performance. In fact, we know that a body weight reduction of as low as 2% via dehydration. So imagine you're doing a bout of exercise and you're sweating and you lose 2% of your body weight. That alone is enough to reduce accuracy and performance. So the classic study we talk about here was in basketball players. So shooting accuracy, so free throw shooting, I think is specifically what they looked at. Um, significant reduction in performance with as little as 2% dehydration. At that level, you also see a significant increase in perception of difficulty of exercise. And so only right at 2%, and again, when I say 2%, I mean percent body weight lost, right? That's what that means. You start getting the three, four, 5% dehydration, you start having a significant reduction in blood volume. And that's incredibly important for endurance. Um, your blood becomes viscous, it gets hard to pump through, um, and you're gonna start having all kinds of issues. So being dehydrated is again, not only going to reduce performance, but because of the mental aspect, which we just walked through, uh, and neuromuscular issue, you're gonna lose accuracy, you're gonna lose total endurance performance, and you're gonna lose speed and power. So we have the triad there. No matter what you're interested in, it's gonna be harmed by being dehydrated. That also is happening then if you're starting your program dehydrated. So um, if you're already 1% or so dehydrated, maybe you're like a little underhydrated and you lose a little bit of sweat, you've already hit that 2%. And so we're starting to see reductions um, in performance there. The same happens on the other side of that hormetic curve. So if you are optimally hydrated in some large window, but you start going past that, we can start running into equal problems. Remember, there is a there is a need for an optimal concentration of sodium and potassium and chloride uh, between your cell, inside your cell and outside your cell. Um, these are electrolytes. This is what we call osmolality and osmolarity is, is really what it is. Think of it like concentration and osmosis, if you remember those terms. So if we are trying to create a muscle contraction that requires an electrical gradient, and so sodium and potassium, 
specifically in magnesium, calcium are positively charged and chloride is negatively charged. And we need to have a certain amount inside the cell and outside the cell so that the positives and the negatives are balanced appropriately um, so that when we move one, we change the voltage and we have, in the case of a muscle contraction. Okay, I just skimmed through a whole lot of, of physiology there to say, if you then go mess with fluid only, and you say, if I were to give you a bolus of you know three liters of pure water right now, you're going to dilute your blood. And so there's not going to be as many chemical, uh, there won't be as many electrical signals in there because you've taken the same amount of sodium, potassium, etc., and put it in a larger volume of pure water. So that gradient is now changed. That becomes a significant problem for contraction. Um, I mean, quite literally, it, it can kill you. This is what we call hyponatremia. Uh, so natremia being spelled N-A, hypo being low. Um, hyponatremia, uh, if you actually go to the periodic chart, N-A is what we uh, use for sodium. So hyponatremia, it's because the word is natremia actually. So that what that literally means is low sodium. And you didn't get that from sweating out all your sodium. You actually get hyponatremia from drinking in too much water. So it's not that the total amount of sodium gets low. It's the fact that the concentration gets low from excessive fluid intake. So in the extremes, in fact, if you look at the, the literature, you'll see um, anywhere between like two to 15% of people who finish endurance races are, are into hyponatremia. Now that varies wildly if you're doing Ironman in Kona versus like, you know, the marathon in Denver in, in October, right? It's, it's gonna be totally different depending on other conditions, but these are all important. Um, so while like death happens, that is sort of extreme, if you back up just a little bit, you start seeing the same types of performance sacraments. In fact, the symptoms can be identical. Brain fog, confusion, performance, uh, irritation, a GI distress. And you think, man, these are symptoms of dehydration. So then you drink more water and you're just exacerbating the problem. Um, it is important that you pay attention to hydration, um, even though, as you sort of mentioned, people tend to just kind of like roll their eyes around it. Because if you're in the middle, it's fine. But if you're anywhere past, not even the extreme extremes, but just that first standard deviation away, um, you're gonna have problems and you might be thinking adrenal fatigue, you might be thinking your testosterone, like you're gonna think all these things and you simply just haven't actually dialed in your hydration. Yeah, uh, I think people sometimes roll their eyes at the discussion of hydration because it just doesn't sound very sexy. It's not yeah. like, doesn't sound like a neurotransmitter or a hormone, it doesn't sound like testosterone or estrogen or DHEA or um, dopamine, but it actually is all of those things. Yeah. It sits at a level beneath all of those, but not beneath on a hierarchy, beneath in, in terms of a foundation. It's actually the, without proper electrolyte balance and hydration, none of the cells of the body can function. And then I think people also hear that, oh, you know, we are 70% water and somehow like it, that statistic alone um, or that fact alone doesn't seem to uh, stimulate any kind of actionable takeaway right it's like great you know uh like gravity also you know keeps us you know from sure. jumping as high as we like you know what do i do and so i think um it's it's important that people understand that every cellular process in the body critically relies on having enough sodium magnesium potassium around and the the way that it's concentrated in fluid water is really the way that you allow every cell in your body to function as well as it possibly could and respond to all the sorts of kind of quote unquote high performance tools yeah. um, that we're talking about. The other thing I've observed uh, many times over is that if people are ingesting too much water and also drinking a lot of caffeine and their electrolytes are low, they get shaky and they actually can have anxiety like symptoms. So when people come into my lab to do studies on anxiety and fear, we ask a few questions and um, those questions include how much water they've had that day. Also a sort of bizarre fact, um, but one that uh, I think is worth mentioning is that when the bladder is full, it stimulates a sort of anxiety. If you ever had to urinate very badly and you're in the car or you can't urinate and then you get to the door, like that's, talk about an anxiety. Totally. Um, and that's because there's a direct neural pathway from the bladder that registers the mechanosensors, how much stretch there is on the bladder that sends a signal to the brainstem alertness areas, broadly speaking, locus ceruleus and others um, that wake us up. These are the, when we're awake, it makes us more awake. And when we're asleep, this is what wakes us up to urinate in the middle of the night. Yeah, that's actually why you can use uh, night urination as a, a pretty good diagnostic of sleep disorders. So if, because of vasopressin, right? Almost exactly what you're talking about. Uh, if you're having sleep disorder issues and you're staying awake and uh, vasopressin gets taken off, right? An APN goes straight to the kidneys. Your kidneys are supposed to be dormant basically at night. You're not supposed to be filtering a lot of, and producing a lot of urine at night. Um, if that's happening and, and say you you have any number of apneas kicking on or anything going on, 
uh, vasopressin keeps going, keeps sending a signal, kidneys start filtering. So if you're waking up and peeing multiple times a night, that's called nocturia. Uh, that is a very, very good sign that either one of two things happen. You One, you have some sort of sleep disorder, or two, you're drinking outrageous amounts of water. And so that's actually a bit of a backward cycle now, right? Because you're drinking way too much water, you're waking up and peeing all night, that's actually ruining your sleep. And so we have seen this a number of times with our sleep company as we go in and it's just like, you don't need any of this crap. You just need to be properly hydrated. Alternatively, if your hydration is sound and you're still waking up more than one time a night to pee on average, then you almost, well, I shouldn't say it like that, but there's a potential that you actually have some sort of uh, sleep disorder or sleep condition going in. So the rule of thumb on that, just so we're here, once or night, once a night or so of urination is fine. Um, if it is routinely or consistently more than two, uh, you need to make some adjustments. Start with hydration. It's the simplest way, right? Getting a full sleep study done. Just figure out hydration. So if you're waking up multiple times and you're urinating and it is a large amount of urine for you and it is clear, that's probably not sleep apnea induced nocturia. That's probably excessive hydration. If you're waking up a bunch of times and it's fairly small amounts of urine, then it's probably not uh, the fluid issue. It's probably the fact that the vasopressin is kicking your kidneys into gear. So that's not a perfect criteria, but it, it's just like a quick little tool you can sort of use. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why we measure almost always uh, your body weight at night, as well as in the morning. So that that's a, like the combat sport in the UFC fighters, boxers, we call that your float. So how much you floated overnight. I like to know that number because I want to know as well your first morning void. So when you wake up and you went to bed at 200 pounds, you woke up the next morning at 195. It's like, oh, you floated five pounds. Did you pee last night? Yeah, yeah, three times. Interesting. Another case, you woke up, you went to bed at 200 pounds. You wake up at 199.5. Okay, you're dehydrated because you should have a, vi a, a certain amount of fluid that you're just respiring out as you're breathing throughout your nose throughout night, ideally. Uh, guaranteed, you're going to wake up. What was your urine like? Oh, yeah, a little bit pretty dark. Like, shocker, you're dehydrated. So you can kind of look at numbers like that. A, a general float is something like a pound to two pounds for the 170 plus pound person. As you scale up, that number can go up a little bit. But you can kind of use these to triage a little bit about what's going on um, with this kind of combination. It's, everything is everything, right? So it's like, it's not just about one sure. system. So you're gonna pay attention. For yes, I'd love to talk about diagnostics for hydration, overhydration, dehydration. To start off, would you be willing to give us some numbers? How much water should we be drinking? The classic rule here, and you're making me do what I hate, right? I wanna give all the caveats first, but I'll go straight to your number. Half an ounce per pound of body weight is a rough rule. So if you weigh again, 200 pounds, that would mean you drink 100 ounces of water a day. Most water bottles are like 12 to 20 ounces, something like that. So, you know, you end up drinking six of those or so a day, kind of like plus or minus. It's the only other thing to add to that is that does not account for exercise induced water loss or sauna or anything like that. So that's assuming just like basal daily needs. If you are uh, exercising or sweating at all for any reasons or work related, so um, folks that work outside or in the heat or uh, a humid environment, this, these numbers all change and you can slide the scale up. But you generally wanna drink about 125% of the fluids you've lost during that physical activity back. And how much do you lose per hour of exercise? It, that number ranges between one to five pounds depending on the person, it can even be higher with some of our uh, athletes. Uh, like I can think of a number of NFL players right now. It's not uncommon for those guys to do eight or nine pounds, even not even like crazy circumstances. If it's August and we're in Jacksonville, it's not wild for us, those guys to go nine, 10 pounds. But what about the typical person who goes to a air conditioned gym or goes out for a run on a day that is somewhere between, let's say 55 degrees Fahrenheit and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. You're probably looking at like a pound. It. It's not extremely high. If you are totally soaked, might be like a pound and a half to two pounds. If you're like, come back and like your pits are a little sweaty and there's a little bit of water kind of on your neckline, it's probably like a more like a pound or so. So in that case, you might drink back a pound and a half of water. 